Hey, this is Mike Freilink. I'm the pastor at The Gathering, and I'd like to welcome you today as you listen to this week's message. I pray it encourages you, challenges you, and draws you closer to God and His purposes for your life. I wanted to start off with a testimony. And um, several years ago, I was in a shopping center on a, on a Saturday morning. It was about 11 o'clock, which is peak hour in a shopping center, and, and it was full. And I remember walking down um, the sort of concourse in the shopping center, and it was packed. And I remember seeing this old African man with a cane walking through the concourse. And um, as I started to walk close to him, uh, I just felt that little nudge, you know, from the Holy Spirit saying, I want you to pray for that guy. And I tried so desperately to ignore the Lord. And I kept walking and walking and walking and walking. I got so convicted. And I said, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. Anyway, I turned around. I was so nervous. I could barely breathe. And um, anyway, I thought, I'm just going to be obedient to the Lord. And I went up to this old man and I said to him, excuse me, sir, can I just pray for your leg? And he said, that would be lovely. And so I put my hand on his shoulder and I, just as I started to pray, his family that had been window shopping um, nearby had seen this rather large white guy uh, laying his hands on a rather small elderly black guy and so had run up to see what was going on and I said they said what are you doing what are you doing and I said I'm just praying for this old man and so they gathered around us and bowed their heads in the concourse of the I almost want to tear up in the concourse of this uh, shopping center and we prayed for this old man now I don't know what the outcome of that was but I know afterwards I felt pretty good about being obedient to the, to the Lord. And I guess for us, so often we have to wrestle against those voices ourselves that sort of say, uh, uh, I feel like I might be rejected, I might be rejected. Another time I was going to work <clears throat> and there was a bus filled with the elderly um, parked right outside the shopping center where I worked. And I was about to go in and I felt the Lord say, I wanted just you to go and tell him and say, those elderly people, what a blessing they are to me. I said, I'm sure I can find another parking somewhere. <laughs> so I drove around and I just could not find a park that was away from the entrance. I physically had to pass the bus. And so I, I was really determined then. I put my head down. I was really, really focused. And I walked straight past that bus, straight into the shopping center, turned right around, went back to the bus. Um, <laughs> and basically stood at the, bu the, at the steps, didn't know what to say. The bus driver was looking at me down the thing like that. I said, can I just share a word? And I, I think I sprinted up the stairs and there were probably about 16 stairs. I, I don't think that there are 16 stairs on a bus, but that's how far it felt. And I sort of ran into the bus and I said, I just want to let every, so anyway, when I got on the bus, there were lots of chatter, lots of laughter. The elderly folk can get up to quite raucous volumes at times. And so they all turn around and it was deadly silence in there. And they're all looking at me and I said, I just want to let you know that the Lord thinks you're such a blessing to him. Amen. And I ran off the bus. <laughs> but as I reflected on it later, I sort of felt that, you know, some, somebody in, the, in that bus probably needed to hear that. And the Lord just needed somebody that had a little bit of courage, a little bit of faith, and a whole lot of, I guess, gumption uh, to be able to get on the bus and deliver that message. Several years ago, and this is sort of my testimony around Heart for the House, um, I'd, I'd just finished up a role and I got all my entitlements out, paid everything, and, and we had $1,000 left. And we sort of said, Whew, you know, finally, after all these years, we've got some money in the bank. Ah, Lord says, give it. <laughs> give it. We finally got some money. We have to give it. And it so, so happened to coincide with Heart for the House. So Barbara and I, we've always, we've always never been begrudging around that. When the Lord speaks to us, as, as, as inconvenient and as uncomfortable it is, um, we, we, we're obeying. And so we, we, we sowed that $1,000 in. You know, it was our last money we had nothing else after that and about three weeks later my mum in South Africa died 
and my brother wasn't in a position to be able to to help him at all uh, to to help my mother in terms of the funeral or anything like that and and I had I just given away all our money I had nothing and so the next thing there was this couple in the church and they just said hey uh, we've been we've been saving up our tithes for for a few months they're in, we're in small business and We've been just waiting on the Lord to tell us when to actually sow that. And so we just wanted to give you this envelope filled with money. And Barbara and I, when we, you know, we didn't want to, you know, it's not like Christmas. You don't sort of rip it open and see how much is in there. Sort of get home shivering, you know. Or I think we may even sat in the car around the, around the corner and have a look. Um, but there was $3,000 in there. And so that paid for my flights to South Africa and a, and a higher car. And that was great. So I was really, really happy about that. And then another lady in the church who subsequently became a friend of ours said, hey, I've got some money that's stuck in South Africa. I've got 8,000 rand stuck in South Africa that I can't get out. How much is the funeral? I said 8,000 rand. So I flew to South Africa and arrived at the... um, I arrived at the, the airport and I, and I got to the check-in car and I'd hired a, a, a Kia Picanto. Has anybody ever been in a Kia Picanto? It's about this big with four doors. <laughs> but it was all I could afford, right? And I got in there and I said, because I was starting to feel a little bit of the favor of the Lord, you know. I said to the guy, can I have an upgrade? The guy looks at me and said, yeah, sure. And he turned around and he gave me a, a flash brand new Kia i30 or a Hyundai i30. And it was great. I, it was great. I, I had a, a, it was a really special time and was able to um, minister to many people there, including my brother. And if, out of the money, the, the spare money, I was able to buy him some clothes and groceries and stuff. And on the way back, because I was feeling the favor of the Lord, I asked the lady at the, the airline check-in if I could get a business class upgrade. And she said, why? And I said, if you don't ask, you don't get and so when I arrived in Johannesburg, I flew from Durban to Johannesburg. I got on the aer- I got to the thing. They gave me my ticket. It was in premium economy. And I sat there, and I flew all the way from Johannesburg to Sydney in premium economy. <laughs> it was great. Anyway, the object of the story is, and the object of the testimony is, when you sow into the house of God, God doesn't forget. God does not forget your cheerful giving. He does not let the seed that you sow go to waste. It is never going to waste. So I guess just as you go into the season, as you, are fe- as you are led by the Lord, as you are led by the Lord, under no compulsion, no, no hype, no nothing, as you are led by the Lord during the season, feel free to give and know that it won't go amiss, that it won't be wasted, and that it won't be um, without bearing fruit. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, for great presence of God, the Lord God Almighty in this place. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful worship this morning, the sense of your, your presence, the sense of your touch. And Lord, as we gather around the word of God this morning to talk about this very special act of Christian, of our Christian life obedience, Lord, we pray that you would open up our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to the things of God. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 18 to 23. Samuel the prophet is rebuking King Saul of Israel from verse 18. Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against him until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And King Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission which the Lord had sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek, and I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the plunder and sheep and oxen and the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it so easy to blame other people when we're caught out? So Samuel said, has the Lord 
as, as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrificing as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of lambs. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Samuel did what Samuel thought was the right thing to do. He chose to sacrifice rather than to obey. We are all accountable and responsible for our obedience to God. And the, and the consequences of those, um, of that obedience, whether it be positive or negative. But Samuel did not obey God's command. And he suffered the consequences of his disobedience. Sorry, Saul. What did I say, Samuel? Thank you. Thank you. You've got a whole lot of people that are actually listening. That's great. It was a test. It was a test. It was a test. You passed. Man, I laugh. They won't get me up again. I think there's probably four major motivators for obedience, of obedience. The first one is a, a sense of duty. So people are obedient as, a, as duty. As a, if you're in the military and somebody tells you to do something, you're, obey, you're obeying because it's a sense of duty, right? Uh, you do stuff out of a sense of duty. The second is if you're obedient for a reward. So if you do stuff because you think you're going to get a reward. And you also do things, you're obedient out of fear. You do things because you're afraid of an outcome. But I guess the one that I love the most is love. And we're obedient because of love. We do stuff out of love. And that, I guess, is God's heart in, at the center of obedience. This morning, I'm going to share two types of godly obedience that have love at the center of that motivation. And the first one is obedience to God's word and obedience to God's spirit. Obedience to the word of God. In the book of James, chapter 1, verse 22, we read, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Hearing is not enough. Doing is what we need to do. We see this in John chapter 14, verse 23 too. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. In Matthew chapter 7 verse 24 to 26. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken to him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on that rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. There's somewhat of a precedent there to follow what, and do what God wants us to do out of the word of God. This book is our manual to living a life in and for Christ. Often people have said, well, this book was written over thousands of years. It's inspired by stories and narrative and poems and written letters and all that kind of stuff. And so, yep, and so it's lost its re re relevance. No, it hasn't. If you read the book of Proverbs... There's a, there's a chapter, 31 chapters of Proverbs. If you read a, 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 a chapter every day of the book of Proverbs, I'm sure you will glean that whatever Solomon and Hezekiah and whoever else wrote in, in that book of Proverbs, you would know that those Proverbs are just as relevant today as they were then. Jesus' teachings are just as relevant today as they were then. We are called to a life of sanctification. Now, sanctification is a big thing. It is, we are called to be conformed to the image of Christ. 
We are supposed to be more and more like Jesus, not more and more like the world. When we give our lives to Jesus, it's, it's a deepening relationship. It's something that we really focus on. It's something that we give glory to God in. And so it's, it's this journey of becoming more and more like Christ, not more and more like the world. We are called to live a life of sanctification, to, con to continue on the journey of a life of salvation which was given as a free gift, seeking to be more and more like Jesus through the reading of his word and the leading in power of the Holy Spirit. We have been given all of that power and all that authority in Christ Jesus. Greater things than these ye shall do, said Jesus. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. A life of sanctification is not being perfect. Can any of you who are perfect please put up your hand? Okay, if, even if we close our eyes, will somebody put up their hand? No? Perfection is not a lifestyle that we can attain to. Sometimes the world, through Photoshop, tries to challenge our teenagers and our children and the people around us to attain to a perfection which does not exist. God does not expect us to be perfect, but he does expect us to be passionate. He wants our hearts more than anything else. He wants our love and he wants us to draw near to him every single day. That's what a life of sanctification is all about. It is not about being perfect. It is about loving Jesus more and more every single day i nearly broke into song but i won't <laughs> the second piece the second obedience that i'd wanted to reference was the obedience to the spirit of god our fleshly spirit is at enmity with the holy spirit your flesh is at war every day of, our, of your life my life with the holy spirit every day it's the reality of the Christian walk. Even Jesus, when he suffered the temptations, which, can I just say, temptation is not a sin. Sin is sin, but temptation is not, because even Jesus was tempted, right? So Jesus suffered those temptations, knowing, sorry, with the, with the devil knowing that Jesus' flesh would be at war with his spirit. The Apostle, Paul, the Apostle Paul writes to the Galatian church in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 26. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The more you are in the Spirit of God, the less you are going to be inclined to want to sin. We are all sinners saved by grace. But the more you are in the Spirit of God, the more you are in the presence of God, your temptation to sin is not going to be as great. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornic fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, Murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires they have been obedient they have been obedient to god if we live in the spirit let us also walk in the spirit we should be spiritual people when we go on to be with the lord it is our spirit that goes up and joins with the lord not our flesh we were always designed to be um, our spirits were always supposed to be conjoined to that of the Lord. He built us for a relationship with him. 
ultimately he didn't want a robot. He didn't want somebody that was going to just be obedient. He just wanted somebody that was going to love him and choose to love him from his own free will. Folks often make the error in believing that being obedient to the Holy Spirit should result in instantaneous results. That's a tough one in charismania right there. It's a tough thing in Pentecostal, Pentecostalism to be able to say that God is actually sovereign. He will do what he wants, with whomever he wants, whenever he wants. After all, he's God, right? To bring glory and honor to his name. But God does expect us to be obedient. When we, when we pray for people, we have, to, we, we're, we, we're, we have to be obedient to the voice of God to pray for people believing that they are going to be healed. Every single time, right there and then. If they're not, that's not us. That's not up to us. That's up to God. But our job is to be obedient. Our job is to be obedient. He wants us to be the readers of the word. He wants us to be hearers of the word. He wants us to be doers of the word. And he wants us to be sowers of his word, his love, and his spirit. We need to be electric conduits for the power of God. I, I've, I, I love the fact when, when you, you just meet somebody and that, is, that God is touching and you just sort of put your hand on their shoulder and they can feel this, the power of God coursing through you. That's not a Justin thing. That's not a human thing. That's the, the, the Spirit of God moving through us as, an, as a conduit into the lives of people. Remember, we are responsible for the obedience. God is responsible for the outcome. Let me say that again. We are responsible for their obedience. God is responsible for the outcome. When God tells us to be obedient, we must be obedient regardless of what the outcome is. Several years ago, well, many years ago, I went to pray for a guy. I think I may have shared this story before. He was, he was, he was dying. The Lord said to me, Justin, I want you to go and pray for him. And I, and I said, okay, cool, I will. And I was filled with faith. And I was believing that the Lord was going to heal him. And I went into ICU and I prayed with him. I held his hand. Got no reaction, no extra blips on the, on the radar, whatever. I had the opportunity to pray for the families on either side of him. For those people too. But Johan died. I remember being very angry with God. So why? Why did he die? You told me to pray for him. Yes. You said you were going to heal him. I said, and the Lord said, what did I say? You told me to pray for him. Yes, that's what I said. The Lord didn't expect me to go and, and have a big miraculous um, uh, you know, recovery. The Lord just expected me to go and be with the man and to pray with him. But then he also gave me the opportunity to share with the families on either side. Remember, we are responsible for the obedience. God is responsible for the outcome. Can I just get the worship team up, please? Thanks. In conclusion, let me state that I'm not saying for one minute that sacrificing for God is not a good thing. It is a good thing. We should. We should sacrifice for God. It puts our flesh aside and we focus on God. So I'm not saying that sacrificing for God is not a good thing. It is a good thing. The Christian life depends on sacrificing the things of the world and embracing the things of God. That is our Christian walk to be more and more like Christ. I'm saying that obedience is better than sacrifice. It is better to obey than to sacrifice. A couple of side thoughts I had on obedience, that obedience in fear is slavery. Obedience in fear is slavery. Obedience in love is service. I'm, obe I'm being obedient to the call and the voice and the leading of the Holy Spirit as I serve you in whatever capacity that may be. 
We read many times in the Old Testament that whenever Israel and Judah were obedient to the statutes and the commandments of God, they were healed. They were made holy and they were made whole. In the New Testament, whenever Jews, Gentiles, Christians were obedient to the Spirit of God, they were healed, they were made holy and they were made whole. It's about obedience in love. I'm obedient to the voice of God, not out of fear, because I love Him for what He has done for me. When He asks me to do stuff, it's not because I'm afraid that He's going to strike me down with a lightning bolt. I'm doing it because I'm so grateful for what He has done for me. The more we love God, the more we are obedient, the more we are obedient to the leading of His Spirit, the more we will want to be like Jesus the more we will want to be like Jesus. Some time ago, I, I was at a shopping center, a very large shopping center in, in Durban, in South Africa. I, I don't know where Barbara and the kids were, but um, the youth pastor of our church was doing outreach with the, the youth of the church and they were going around evangelizing. Uh, I, I, that's a struggle for me, I'm just saying. Anyway, Andy said to me, you know, why don't you come and join us? I said, yeah, no, no, thanks. It's all right. You, you go ahead. And I said, look, I tell you what, if I feel led to pray for anybody, I will. I will. I'll, I'll take it seriously. So Andy, off he, off he went. And I, I sort of remember sitting on this bench at Gateway Shopping Center. And I'm I praying to the Lord. I said, Lord, just, just show me somebody that you want me to pray for. Just show me somebody that you want me to pray for. The next thing I saw, I just had this picture of this blonde lady in a yellow polo shirt. I said, okay, I'll go and find her. I'll go and find her. And I walked up and down, up and down, up and down the shopping center looking for a lady in a yellow polo, almost hoping that I couldn't find her. Just so. And I walked up and down and, it, and I'll never forget the store. It was an Esprit store. As I walked past, I saw this blonde lady in the yellow polo and then the fear set in and I remember standing there and I was shaking I was so nervous I was I was so nervous and I just knew that I had to be obedient to what God had shown me and so I walked up to this lady and I I, I didn't know what to expect and I said to her excuse me this may sound really, really random, but I'd really like to pray for you. And she just burst into tears. And she said, this morning I'd been to the oncologist and found out that I've just been diagnosed with breast cancer. And I came away from the meeting saying, God, if there is a God, if you really, really exist, you will come and show yourself to me today. And so I prayed for the lady right there and then. I don't know whatever happened to her. I'd like to believe that the Lord touched her in a mighty, mighty way. But ultimately, that's what we're called to do. We're not, we're not there to hang around to see or to reap the glory. That's God's job. Our job is to walk in that obedience, in that obedience. We have to be obedient, I believe, to three things. The first is the great commandment in Matthew chapter 22, verse 33 to 39. You shall love, the, you shall, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Commandment. And the second is like it, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. The second is the great commission in Matthew 28 verse 19 to 20. Go therefore and make disciples of the, all the nations. Make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe and obey all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. 
And the third is that we need to be obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit. In love with His strength and the knowledge of who we are and whose we are. Jesus said to Peter, come. It was an instruction. It was an instruction. And Peter had to obey. He had to choose to obey. Let me rephrase that. He had to choose to obey. He could have stayed in the boat or he could have gotten out. And in that obedience, it took faith. Obedience takes faith. I'm not saying when somebody's wielding a big stick, that doesn't take a lot of faith. But when you love somebody and, and the Lord is prompting you and the Holy Spirit is whispering to you and he's nudging you and he's saying, I want you to do this. It takes faith. Because in that faith is the courage that there's a godly outcome. But even as a human being, as in our flesh, we won't necessarily see the, or reap. But we know that we, and we trust in a God that is so much bigger than anything we could ever comprehend. Oh, oh, thank you, Lord. And as we, as we surrender ourselves, as we surrender our flesh to the Lord God and His leading of His Holy Spirit, we will see the miraculous happen. When Peter climbed out of the boat, he did not hesitate. I don't see anywhere in the Word of God that he had to, that he tested the water with his big toe before he stood on it. He was almost like a puppy. He jumped out of the boat and was walking on the water. He was trusting in his Lord. He was being come obedient. On, come on. There's a whole sermon around that. It was his doubt that robbed him of the true miracle. And when you're being obedient to God, may I just encourage you that don't let the enemy speak doubt into your mind. Come on. Don't let the outcomes or the fear of, the, of a positive out, or of a negative outcome deter you from walking in obedience. As it says in 1 Nike 2 verse 3, just do it. Can I will ask you all, please, if you're able to stand. Can I ask you all, please, if you're able to sit? Sit. How easy is it to obey the voice of man? Come on, it's so true, Justin. How easy is it to obey the voice of a man? My challenge to you this morning is, if you can obey my voice, then would you be prepared to obey the voice of the Almighty God? Come on. Yeah. Amen. I'm going to finish in prayer, but I know from the Holy Spirit this morning that there are people here that are needing to take that step of faith this morning. There are people here that have that burning notion within them that they need to obey the voice of God. God has been telling you to do something for a long time. And you've just, just not got there. You just haven't had the faith or you just haven't had the unction or you just haven't had, I guess, I don't know what it is. You just, it just hasn't materialized for you. But I want to encourage you today that today's the day that the yeah. Lord will give you the faith to do what you need to do, what He has called and asked you to do. If you would like to be obedient to the voice of God, after we've prayed, we're going to have some time. And I'd really like you to come up. We'll pray for you. We'll minister to you. We'll encourage you to take those steps of faith in obedience to the voice of God. Lord God, we just thank you for today. Yeah. We thank you for today. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lord, we are so, 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 so grateful for who you are. And we're so grateful that we are children of the Most High God. And Lord, we know that you are good you are good and your plan for us is good and even if the journey is uncertain at times and we don't know 
where we are and we feel insecure, we feel lost, we feel alone, we feel, I don't know, disconnected. Lord, you know where we are. And Lord, as you work in our hearts and our minds and our spirits, as you nudge, as you whisper, as you breathe on us, Lord, as you ask us, instruct us, command us, Father, give us the faith, the strength, the courage, and the obedience to follow through. And this morning, Lord, as, as I conclude in prayer, Lord, I just invite people in this, in this audience, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that have been struggling to obey, Lord, to take that step of faith today. As Jesus said, come. As Jesus said, come. Today is the day. Thank you, Jesus.